today. We'll devote our entire morning. We'll make it all the way through the 14 verses of 3 John. And you'll remember that the Apostle John wrote these two letters to address two different aspects of the exact same problem that a number of churches were facing at the time that he was writing. And in order for us to really grasp what John was trying to address, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, first century culture. And it's not even just first century church culture, but that's specifically what we'll talk about. But in the first century, there were two main sources of influence upon the churches. There were guys like me. I would use the word stationary and this is why is that guys like me who have the office of pastor teacher we stay in one place we are devoted to one local congregation and we devote our lives to overseeing caring for and equipping a congregation for the works of ministry that God has called that congregation to and you may think wow that's just kind of a narrow scope it is a full time and a half job it really is, even a very small church, but in a growing church like ours, it, it's, it's a lot of work. And so there were also people who came alongside. There were those who were stationary. You had prophets, you had evangelists, you had itinerant ministers that traveled from place to place, and they would focus on evangelism or they would focus on music ministry, or the Lord would give them a special series of teachings and maybe they would come to a local church and they would present those teachings. And working hand in hand with the local pastor that was there, that church would be even better equipped for the work and the call that God has given to them. Now, this is in no way a dig, okay, what I'm about to say, but in those days, traveling ministers did not have Learjets. <laughs> and they didn't travel in personal RVs. And there's nothing wrong with having a, a, a Learjet if, if your ministry requires a Learjet and God provides it. I'm still praying for mine. I don't know that I'll ever get it. <laughs> Pretty happy with my 2000 Honda right now, okay? But, you know, I know a lot of very, very godly people who travel in RVs because it saves them from having to be in a different hotel every night and things like that. There's nothing wrong with that. But in the days that we're reading about, there were no Learjets and there were no personal RVs. There were no hotels. There were no Airbnbs. So when they came to town, what would happen is that the Christians were supposed to open their homes to them, host them, provide for them while they were there ministering food and a place to lay their head, doing works of service towards them. And, and the reason why is because in most of these towns and villages, if there was an inn or something similar to what you and I would call a hotel, they weren't anything like what you and I are used to. Mo most of the inns were dangerous and disreputable houses of prostitution that grew, or I'm sorry, drew all sorts of surly people. And so I just want you to imagine that, that you're the pastor or a leader in a local church and a guy contacts you and he says, hey, you know, you guys invited us to come and we just wanted to let you know we're going to be there on such and such a time. And you say, okay, well, you know, hopefully when you get here, the inn will have room for you, right? And the guy would go, so you're going to put me at a place where there's robbers and thieves and prostitutes and everything and that's where you're going to put me? And so the Christians say, no, I would never ever do that. We're going to open our home. We're going to feed you with our food. We're going to give an offering so that as you make your way to the next town, you'll have a little bit of money in your pocket to support the ministry and, you know, so that you can buy a coffee on the way or feed your animal, whatever it is. Now, if you remember when we were in Second John last week, John was writing to a church and we said that they were practicing sloppy agape. Remember that? Sloppy agape. What they were doing is that they were showing love and hospitality, but, but they weren't tempering it with truth. And so anybody who came along, whether they were a false teacher or any kind of a charlatan, that group was just opening the church, opening the pulpit. They were having these guys into their homes. They were giving them money. And as they went away, they would pray over them, you know, God bless you. God bless your ministry. And John said, stop it. He said, I'm going to remind you how you choose who you should support. Ask them 
who is Jesus? And if they cannot give you a biblical answer, you do not have them teach at your church. You do not bring them into your home. You do not give them a financial offering. Don't even say God bless you as they move along. So here in 3 John, we have the other side of the coin. And John's writing to a church that had a very serious problem in that there was a leader in this church that had a personal agenda. And this personal agenda resulted in the lack of hospitality shown towards traveling ministers. So the first church, anything goes. Anybody can speak from our pulpit and we'll just send money to anybody. And then this next church, John says, I've actually recommended men come speak at your church. But as they've arrived, you guys have not received them. You've not blessed them. You've not encouraged them. In fact, they've given a bad report about who you are and how you do ministry. And, and so John says, I'm, I'm writing now to correct that. And so if you would, I just want to couple more things, then we're going to dig right into the text. How many of you know that where there are people, there is trouble? <laughs> Let's just be honest. And, and this is what I'm getting at. I've heard more times, if I had a nickel for this, I'd have my Learjet. When people say, you know, we just need to get back to how things were in the early church, right? And they've got this overly romantic idea of what it was like in the early church, that everybody was just perfect. Here, here's the problem. Guess who came to the early church? People. And where there's people, there's... Look, look up at the screen. One of my favorite Bible commentators wrote something. I'm going to give you half of it first. He said what we're talking about. Wherever there are people, there are problems. For the last two weeks, we've looked at people gathering called churches and there were problems. But notice this. We're looking today at a church experiencing problems. Look at the next part of, of what this commentator said. He said, wherever there are people, there are problems. And he says the potential for solving problems. Each of us must honestly face the question, am I a part of the problem or am I a part of the answer? And this is why I said that God's going to speak to all of us today, because whether it's in the church, whether it's in the home, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in your neighborhood, we're going to face problems because we're going to be with people. And John's going to speak to us today about three different men in this church, and he's going to show us how one of them was causing problems and two of them were the solution to the problems. So I'm going to tell you what my prayer is today. And I'm really going out on a limb. I'm going to start offending people just right here in the introduction, okay? I'm praying that first and foremost, the Lord would begin to reveal to every person in this room where you might be the source of the problem, where you're having any kind of conflict or any kind of trouble. I'm praying first that you would see where you're responsible for being part of the problem. Then afterwards, I'm praying that the Lord would show each of us the solution and how we're to be that solution. And so, with no more delay, I'm going to read the first four verses of 3 John, and then we will dig in. He begins with the phrase, the elder, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. We've read that. That's our introduction. We're going to pray, and we are going to study. Father, this morning, we want to pray that you would speak specifically to every person here that you would speak to every person regarding any conflict, any trouble that they're experiencing and reveal to them, Lord, where they may be part of the problem. And then, Lord, having done that, I pray that you would reveal to them where they are the solution. And it's all right here in 3 John. And so we pray that you would speak to us because this is going to be a very fruitful morning in the kingdom of God and in our personal discipleship process. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now notice that we begin the same way we did last week. John opens this letter by identifying himself as the elder. Now we've put a great deal of time into proving why 
1st, 2nd, and 3rd John were written by John, and we're not going to do that again today. You can go back and you can listen to last week's message if you missed that. But as we said last week, John used this phrase because he was the last living apostle at the time that this letter was written. And by using this phrase, the elder, this is so important, John is not saying, hey, I'm just sending you a, a postcard from a sunny vacation spot to say hi. How you doing? Hope everything's well. Rather, what John is doing is he's writing and he's reminding the people who will read this letter that this is an official church document and the things contained within are to be applied to personal lives and to church practices. Personal lives, church practices. And so a couple of things that, that we should think about here. We're, we're two words into our Bible study and we already have a, an application point, a place to stop and just to say, Lord, what is it that you want me to learn from this? Number one here, the first thing we're going to talk about application wise is how often do we go to a Bible study or sit through a church service or you're driving down the road listening to Charles Stanley or your favorite Bible teacher, whatever it is, or you're even just listening to scripture and you go, you know who needs to hear this? How, how many of you do that? How many of you just lied by not raising your hand? I mean, we all do that. This is what happens is that first truth starts ringing in our heart and then we go, I know where this applies. My wife, my husband, my kids, my boss, right? What I want to do real quick is I want everybody just to take a minute and, and consider the fact that this is for us first before it's for anybody else. John is writing, he's saying, I am an apostle. I write with apostolic authority and the things that I'm writing are first to be considered for our own lives and then for church practice. This is not for everybody else, this is for you. And then when you get it down, then it'll be for you to teach to others. So just, I want you to say this out loud today. Me first. This is the only time you can put you first is when we're talking about applying scripture. Me first, Lord. I want this to, you know, me first, okay? So that brings us to the first person that John mentions, the first of three. And this is Gaius, and we're going to call him a fellow worker for the truth. Verses 1 through 8. Notice John writes, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Now, the New Testament lists four different men named Gaius. If you study through the New Testament, you find that three of them were acquaintances and ministry partners of the Apostle Paul. And this fourth one is a personal friend and ministry partner of John's, but, but there's even more. I want you to notice how he addressed him. He called him the beloved Gaius. And if you were to get out your Greek, Hebrew, interlinear, or a, a concordance, you would find that this isn't simply beloved. This is well-beloved. This is a personal greeting. This is John saying to this man, Gaius, I love you so much. We have a very special relationship. In fact, as we go through this morning, you're going to find that John refers to Gaius three times as beloved, well-beloved, three different times. Why? What, what made this relationship between John and this friend of his so special? Notice the next thing that John writes, whom I love in truth. Now, if you can give me your full attention while flipping back to 1 John, just a couple of pages, chapter 1, Give me your full attention, but keep flipping. I want you to see in what we're about to talk about that the reason this relationship is so special is that it wasn't based on a similar hobby. You know, to the beloved Gaius, who we ride motorcycles together every Sunday after church. Okay? It's not that. It wasn't because they shared a favorite gladiator in the Roman games, right? It wasn't that their favorite chariot NASCAR team was winning that year. It's nothing like that. I want you to see that their relationship was based on their common love for and faith in Jesus. And before we go on, how many of you have a favorite football team? How many of you can have true fellowship with those of us who have a different football team that is our favorite? Not as many hands went up. You're going to learn something right now. Check this out. 
This is very similar to what John wrote in 1 John chapter 1. This is so important, folks. Notice this. 1 John 1, 3. John says, That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. Just so you know, that's Jesus. Just so simply just put, we declared to you, Jesus, that you also may have fellowship with us. And then look at this next line. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. This is huge. This is so important. This is what links believers together. Our fellowship is in Jesus. Our fellowship is in nothing less than Jesus. Now, we can fellowship over football, and it may be more pleasant when we both like the same team and when our team is winning. And it might be more pleasant for me when we're fellowshipping and my team is winning. And it's not quite as pleasant for me when your team is winning, right? That's why we don't make our fellowship over things like that or over secondary doctrines. Do you think we're going to have belly buttons when we get into heaven? Okay, so those of us who do, we sit on this side of the church and we snarl at those on this side of the church who don't believe that. We don't believe that, right? And we can't have fellowship. It's just crazy, isn't it, how people will do stuff like this. John and Gaius had a very special relation, excuse me, relationship. Look at verse 4. These things we write to you that your joy may be full. And John says when Jesus is the reason that we hang out, when Jesus is the reason that we have a connection, there is so much joy because we don't argue over Jesus, do we? We just love him. And we worship him and we praise him and we talk about him and we read his word and that's what our fellowship is about and so John and Gaius had this amazing relationship because they both loved Jesus first and foremost now as you turn back to third John we have another personal application I'm gonna ask you to take a minute and do some personal examination right now I want you to examine your relationships the closest relationships that you have on this earth the people that you really enjoy spending time with and hanging out with what are those relationships based in like I recently had somebody tell me I, I hadn't seen them at church for a while followed up with them and you know as we got through the conversation it, it kind of came out you know I just don't feel comfortable at church I feel way more comfortable with my non-church friends and oh you can just imagine how the rest of that conversation went right oh really <laughs> no I didn't beat anybody up I was very gentle but the truth of the matter is I mean how do you respond to that okay well what do you do when you're with your non-church friends that makes you so comfortable well you know what I'm and this isn't what happened I'm now making this up so know that I'm now making this part up I just don't feel comfortable you know cracking a couple of pop tops with my church friends you know I just I don't feel comfortable doing shots with my church friends I feel comfortable with those other people because they don't judge me for those things <sighs> maybe those are the things we're not supposed to be finding fellowship in. those are the things we're not supposed to be finding connection with other people look at your life where are the closest connections and, and what do you do when you're with those people with who you have the closest connections now back to first John I'm sorry third John and we'll be here for the rest of the morning we have no need to leave third John again because it's such an inclusive book I want you to notice this verse 4 John says another thing he says I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth now last week, John said this to the audience in, in 2 John. He said, it, it just brings me great joy when I see the people that are my spiritual children, members of the church, maybe people that I've led to Christ, walking in truth. But this is personal in 3 John. He's speaking here specifically of Gaius. And there are many believers and students of the Bible including me, I'll tell you where I stand on this, that believe that John at some point in the past led Gaius to Christ and then devoted himself to helping Gaius grow as a fruitful disciple of Jesus and then now years later, 
Gaius and John are living in separate cities, serving in separate churches, and word comes to John from a group of people that Gaius is still walking with the Lord and bearing fruit in his relationship. And I got to tell you that there's, there's nothing like leading somebody to Christ. And there's nothing like pouring into them in their discipleship process. And then years later, getting an email or a phone call where they contact you and they say, guess what? I'm going on the mission field. Or guess what? They've asked me to lead the youth group at our church. Guess what? I just joined the worship team. You know, something like that. And maybe you haven't even talked to them in a couple of years. You led them to Christ. You were part of their discipleship. You guys ended up in different places. And then all of a sudden, you're just welling up with joy. You're thinking back to those awesome times of fellowship you had. And that's where John's at right now. He's just saying, Jesus, thank you so much for what you're doing in Gaius's life. Because this is a special guy. Now we get to verse 2. And it's important that we look at this verse instead of skimming over it. John says to Gaius, he says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now, the reason it's important that we take a few minutes and we look at this verse is because this one verse that happens to be in the introduction of 3 John rather than in the theological body of the letter has been the source of much false doctrine that has found its way into the church. Now, as you look at this, it's interesting because what John is saying, I, I want you to look at it with me. He says, I pray that you may prosper in all things, that you be in health, just as your soul prospers. In, in the most simple form, what John is saying is, brother, your soul is prospering. You're growing spiritually. He says, and it is my prayer that every area of your life would be affected by what's going on in your soul, that, that it would match. But what John is not saying is that he's, John isn't building a doctrine that says that when our soul is prospering, that we are going to be healthy and we are going to be wealthy and we are going to be trouble free and constantly prosperous. As you study the entirety of the New Testament, as you study the entirety of the Bible, you find that there were many very, very godly people that suffered a great deal and that God used that suffering to mature them, to complete them. We're studying Job on Wednesday nights right now, and as we get into the closing chapters over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see that God used suffering in the life of Job to reveal himself to Job. As you study the life of the Apostle Paul, you find that Paul had what he called a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. And that he cried out to the Lord three times, which is a, a Hebrew way of saying, I sought the Lord completely. I sought the Lord until he showed me my answer. And God's answer for Paul in that was, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee because my strength is made perfect in your suffering and in your weakness. And so it's, it's really, really scary to see what oftentimes happens. There's entire TV networks that are devoted to these health, wealth, and prosperity teachings. There's, you know, entire movements within the church. And the problem with this is that when you're promised that your walk with the Lord will always produce health, wealth, and prosperity at all times, when it doesn't happen, and you go and ask, why is this not working? You are always going to get one of two answers. Brother, you don't have enough faith. Or brother, you have hidden sin in your life. It's going to be one of those two. I know because I used to go to that church for a long time. And I asked those questions and I got those answers. And then I started studying the word for myself. So I want you to know that what John is giving here is what was a very, very common greeting both in religious and non-religious writings. They have found scrolls and documents from all sorts of different time periods, both religious and non-religious, that have this exact greeting. It's like me walking up to you at church and saying, how's it going? And you say, it's going really good. I say, well, you know what? I just really pray that the Lord continue to bless you as you grow in the Lord. 
and you go, amen, thanks, Pastor Randy. And then you say to me, and I pray the same for you. Cool, right on. And we can both be assured that we're going to probably face some trials, right? That the Lord's going to be faithful and we're going to grow as we go through there. And there's a flip side to this. There are some believers that for some reason God has chosen to bless them and give them the most amazing abundance, right? I know some believers that accidentally make more money in a year than some of us who, you know, are just, they just happen to know how to make money. It's a gift that God has given them. And what's so beautiful is when people who are that way are generous towards the Lord and generous towards other people. So there's a rule in biblical interpretation, and, and that is that you have to be very careful when you're building doctrine. And you will very rarely build doctrine out of the introduction of a book. Now, verse 3, John says this, I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Now, this kind of sets the tone, gives us a little bit of background for 3 John. And we, we find that there was a group of believers that came and visited John. They spoke to him about this church where Gaius was serving. And they came and they told him about a number of things that were going on in this church, and some were good and some were bad. And so they began by telling John and the church that John pastored that Gaius was not only walking in the truth, but he had effectively ministered to them when they had been at his church. And as they were there with Gaius, they decided that they needed to go contact John and say, John, you just got to encourage this guy because he's really rocking it with his faith. He's serving people, everything as well. But John, you also need to know that there's some things going on in this other church that you might need to deal with. And so John speaks to Gaius in verse 5, and this is so beautiful. This is so cool, and I really pray that you see yourself in these verses. John says to Gaius, Beloved, well-loved brother, he says, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers and, oh, I'm sorry, for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. So these guys come and they meet up with Pastor John and they, they say to him, John, we want to tell you what we see going on in the life and ministry of Gaius. And what we're going to do is we're going to look in verses 5 through 7, and we're going to hone in on three or four things that these guys came and told John about. Notice they said that Gaius served faithfully. Notice this phrase, Gaius, you do faithfully whatever you do. I want you guys to see this. This is so important. This is applicable in every one of our lives right now. The first thing I want you to see is that Gaius served in his church and he served faithfully. Now, we don't know how he served. We don't really know if he was part of the leadership team and maybe some weekends he studied the word, he prayed, he prepared a Bible study, he stood in the pulpit and he taught. We think that maybe he was something maybe lesser than that in the church. Maybe he was uh, a member of the worship team or, or maybe he served in the children's ministry. Maybe he worked out in the parking lot or handed out bulletins as people arrived. We really don't know what he did, but the one thing we do know is how he did it. And, and, and John says this, Gaius, you served faithfully. So I'm gonna throw out a question that I believe the text demands. And that is this, to, to every person who is a member of a church somewhere, whether it's here or you're visiting from somewhere else, are you serving in your church? Um, I'll just throw this out. Church, as far as I can tell from studying the New Testament, is not a spectator sport. That's called baseball or football or NASCAR or something like that. How many of you wish you could get in a NASCAR and just drive that thing around the track a couple of times? How many of you dream of being the quarterback? How many, okay. Chances are you're not going to drive a NASCAR. 
chances are you're not going to be a professional quarterback or a professional pitcher. But you know what? The chances are 100% that whatever God is stirring in your heart to do in the kingdom of God, you're probably going to end up doing it. Because if your heart is being stirred, that's the Holy Spirit. And as you look at Romans 12 through 14, and you look at, I'm sorry, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, Paul reminds us that you and I are a body. And we have to operate as a body. And so some people, I'm the mouth. I'm sorry. I'm the mouth and the vocal cords. I wish I was the brain. I'm not. I'm the mouth and the vocal cords. You know, some of you are the elbow. Some of you are the big toe. I know a couple of people in our church that, you know, they just ascribe to be the armpit. It's just what they do, you know. Yeah, I'm just saying you got to set your sights a little higher, ladies and gentlemen, as you're serving in the church. But the bottom line is this. Gaius served. And how did he serve? Check this out. He served faithfully in whatever he did. And in a moment, we're going to learn what he did. But let's go a little bit further. I want you to notice that he served diversely. And this is what's really neat is that oftentimes, and I'll be honest with you, I suffer from this. I love ministering with adults. I love the fact that you guys can sit for 45 minutes or an hour or more and listen to a Bible study. I tried teaching kids at our chapel services at the Calvary Chapel School in Albuquerque and I prepared a Bible study. I had Greek and Hebrew definitions. I had a three-point outline. Right? I had challenges and application points and as I get up there and start I've got little kids crawling over the row and poking the kid behind them and I realize 